for the adults. Uh, our text tonight is 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, verses 1 and 2. 1 Timothy 5, uh, verses 1 and 2. You can go ahead and turn your Bible there, though I will warn you, I'm pretty sure this is the longest introduction uh, I have ever given in my life, so we'll be there in a half hour or so. But uh, 1 Timothy 5, uh, verses 1 and 2 is our text uh, for tonight. And by way of introducing the text tonight, I want to introduce these thoughts uh, leading up to the text. Every single person who has ever been born was born into a family. Family is the first community that we experience when we're born. And it is in family that we're supposed to learn what leadership is, that we're to learn what it means to follow, that we're to learn what it means to interact with others, what it means to love, what it means to handle conflict, what it means to apologize and repent, what it means to forgive, and what it means to belong. Every single person, I believe this, whether they'll admit it or not, every single person has very strong feelings about their families. When some people think of their families, they're filled with joy and with gratitude and with love. And when other people think of their families, they're filled with grief and disappointment and discouragement and pain and heartache and sorrow and anger and bitterness. And still, when others think about their families, other people feel both wonderful emotions of love and joy as well as strong feelings of disappointment and disaffection simultaneously. And whether your family is amazing in your eyes, or you've never met them, or your family experience is somewhere in between, you have strong feelings about your family. And it is family that oftentimes gives us our most powerful and strongest memories. There are wonderful memories of birthdays, and holidays, and vacations, and daily life, and laughing, and playing, and helping, and serving, and living together, and many of these things make up many of our most precious and cherished memories. In addition to this, family also gives us memories of some of our most traumatic and awful moments in our lives as well. Perhaps we feel an overwhelming ache and sorrow in our hearts and it becomes even difficult to breathe when we contemplate the loss of a loved one at certain times. Or maybe we're angry and upset and depressed when we think about the awful abuse or neglect that took place in our families and we can't even bear to think about it because there's so many horrible things that come flooding black into our minds that it overwhelms us so we just kind of, we, we can't even go there. So family and our experience of family, for better or worse, it's very powerful. And no matter what your family experience is, perhaps it is in family that testifies most clearly and powerfully for our need to be saved. God's commandment to children is that they honor and obey their parents, right? Ephesians 6, Colossians 3. And yet every single one of us has dishonored and disobeyed our parents at some time during our lives. God's command is that parents bring their children up in the fear and instruction of the Lord. Yet unfortunately, we've all sinned and made mistakes as parents in raising our children. Maybe it's neglecting their spiritual or physical needs, or maybe we've abandoned our children or abused our children or ignored our children uh, or helped them love the world and love sin more. Well, whatever it is, every parent has failed in some manner and sinned in their parenting. We've sinned in our marriages as well. We can spend much time contemplating the different ways that this has occurred. But if in any way you have ever sinned even one time in your family relationships, you need to be saved. If you're not perfect and sinless, and nobody is, you need the salvation that Jesus offers all people. Christ died for the sins that not only you have committed in your family relationships, but also the sins you've committed in every other area of your life as well. And if you will believe that his death on the cross is the sufficient payment for your sins, and if you will surrender your life to him and pledge your allegiance to follow him all of your days, then he will save you from your sins, all of your sins, the one, even the ones you committed in your family. And not only will you be saved from your sins, 
But amazingly, wonderfully, you will also be reconciled to God and you'll become his child. And for the purposes of our focus tonight, you will become part of his family. When we become believers in Jesus, we become the children of God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. John says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. And he goes on to say this, Beloved, we are God's children now. Right now. Not someday in the future, now. Romans 8, verses 14 through 16 tell us that those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. And when we became believers, we received God's Spirit within us, and that Spirit is a Spirit of sonship. And when we receive the Spirit as we're converted, we are adopted into God's family, and God becomes our Father. And it's a wonderful family reality when we are adopted by God, we are filled with the Spirit of God. We are sealed to God forever. He becomes our God. He'll never leave us. He'll never stop doing good to us. He'll discipline us for our good. He'll provide for our needs. And He will shepherd us into Christ-likeness. We enter into a relationship where God is the Father of our very souls. Now, shortly after saying this in Romans 8, if you read on in verse 29, Paul also goes on to tell us that believers are brothers in the Lord. In other words, through the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are not only reconciled to God, not only do we gain God himself as our perfect and wonderful father, but also we gain all true believers as spiritual family members as well. And it is our spiritual family that is our eternal family. And it's a family built on the glory of Christ in his gospel. It's a family ruled by God himself through his holy word. It's a family that is filled with the spirit and that produces godly fruit within each family member. It's a family that has an eternal inheritance in glory in the new heavens and the new earth with Jesus himself. And as a family, we will enjoy his presence, his majesty, and his worth forever. It's a family that one day, when our salvation is consummated and fully realized, it will, this family will be as unified as the Trinity and will have the exact same quality of love as the Father has for Jesus himself. This spiritual family, it's not built on the name of man. It isn't built on mere human lineage. It isn't built on any worldly thing, but rather it's built on Christ himself. And in Matthew chapter 12, verse 46 through 50, Jesus showed no favoritism towards his earthly family. And instead, he said that those who are truly his mothers and brothers and sisters, they consist of those who do the will of his father. Our earthly families are very important. However, they are not eternal if our earthly family members are not in Christ. If they are not rooted and grounded in Christ and his gospel, then our earthly families, they're missing the entire point for which they exist. Now, for sure, we must continue to love and serve our unbelieving family members and be in their lives with the hope that God may work and our earthly families can live into the purpose for which they were made and also become our spiritual family as well. But it is important that realizing the distinction between our unbelieving earthly family and the glory of our spiritual family, Jesus himself declares that his true and ultimate brothers and sisters and mothers, they are those who do the will of God, not those who share a common ancestry. The worshipers of God are truly Christ's people in the ultimate sense. And it is with them that he belongs. It is with the children of God that he is at home. And if that's true for Christ, it is also true for us. Now again, it's a wonderful blessing when our earthly family members are also part of our spiritual family members because they're believers. Christ is life. He is our purpose and meaning. He is our aim and goal. And it is those with whom we share this life in Him that we are at home with and that we are the closest with. If you are a believer 
And the people you feel closest with are those who are not Christians or those who are very weak in the Lord. That's a concern. And if that's the case, I'd like to help you with that. And please, let's talk afterwards. Those who cherish Christ should be the closest with those who share a common adoration of Jesus. That doesn't mean we don't love unbelievers. It doesn't mean we don't spend time with them. Uh, we just got them praying about these encouraging times we have with unbelievers. But what it does mean is that as it pertains to genuine relational closeness, how can light say that their BFF is darkness? When two people have such a completely different spiritual foundation for their lives in eternity, what, common, what true commonality is there? How can lovers of Christ and haters of Christ be intimate? It's, it, it, we can't. This is all 2 Corinthians 7 stuff. Now listen, as the family of God, as brothers and sisters in the Lord, we truly are a spiritual family now, not just at the resurrection. We truly have the Spirit now. We truly bear the fruit of the Spirit now. We truly have fellowship with each other and are capable of great intimacy now, not just in glory. That's true. Nevertheless, there is also the painful reality that not one Christian is yet perfected. Every believer or family member of God's spiritual household still has remaining sin and immaturity. We are not fully conformed to the image of Christ. And this reality is ever with us. So, what's important is that there is both a very real realization of the love, unity, joy, and sweet fellowship that we have in Christ. That, that It's important for us to realize that that is a reality now. And we must also realize the presence of remaining sin and conflicts. They weaken relationships, they break relationships, they create strife, and they lead to difficulty. Both of those things are a simultaneous reality within the church. And it's important to understand that. Because if you don't have any category for conflict, you'll think the only Christian relationships are one without friction. And you'll have them, and eventually something will come up, and you'll be like, that's not real. And on the other hand, if you think, oh no, this is a, that's not true, there's no spiritual unity and fellowship now, you're going to be just destroyed in cynicism, <laughs> and you'll never pursue what God has for you in this life. So we must realize both. And the most mature Christians recognize that there is real love and fellowship to be had in this life. They pursue it. They live into it. And when the reality of remaining sin reveals its ugly presence and causes relationships to not work out how they had hoped, mature Christians, though they, they, are, though they are discouraged by this, and it's not wrong to, to feel sad about it, but mature Christians don't indulge a self-pitying pout party. They don't give up. They don't stop trying to grow in relationships. They don't allow themselves to be hardened by cynicism and believe that the reality of authentic Christian fellowship and oneness and love and unity doesn't exist in this life. Instead, mature believers understand that this is a process. They understand that they themselves are part of the problem. They understand that the cross, man, it's got to wash us daily. They understand that God does a long and patient work in his people. They understand that not everything comes right away. They understand that God will complete his work in his church. And through their hurts and through their disappointments, they resist the temptation of self-pity. And with gospel-created toughness and perseverance, they walk out the sometimes difficult but always blessed calling of real Christian love. So many people experience the reality of remaining sin in the church, and then, because they're self-absorbed, they pout, they embrace cynicism about the church, and to keep themselves from ever being disappointed again, they live very weak, unloving, self-absorbed, powerless lives in the Lord as they sink into a demonic lovelessness and withdraw from the body that they have justified because at some point in their life in the church they were hurt or disappointed by believers. And these same people, when they're in this mindset, they never sufficiently feel the weight of their own sins and contributions to the problems, even if their words hypocritically acknowledge it. 
Instead, they mope around and they're filled with a very disaffected heart and mindset towards God's people. And, and they forget that God's people are the reward of Christ's suffering. And in their words, in their attitudes, and in their demeanor, they are very hopeless for Christ's bride. And to be around them is to come away feeling very depleted and discouraged. And it is in the unavoidable reality of conflict in God's family where which, where which type of person you are will be revealed. True, genuine life in the body. I'm not talking about saying hi to each other, Ed. I'm talking about really being in each other's lives. True, genuine life in the body will show you, it will show you who you are and not necessarily who you think you are or who you want to be. It's in the blessings, the joys, the fellowships, and the crucible of conflict in the body where if you're the immature Christian, God will sanctify you and use those things to make you mature and strong in Him. And when conflict arises among us as the family of God, and it will, our text tonight reminds us that we must approach each other as dear and beloved family members. And what is tragic to me is that we are willing to overlook so many sins and flaws in our earthly, unconverted family members and bear with them because they're our natural brothers, sisters, children, or parents. But when it comes to our eternal family, we're so quick to cut ties with each other over the same flaws. That doesn't bother me we bear with unbelieving families. That's not my point. I'm we'll bear with them, but we won't bear with the eternal family. And that kind of way of life, I will argue this, and I don't think this is an overstatement, it is a blasphemous way of life. And it's living a, it is a living contradiction to the gospel if we confess that we are the ones who, if we confess Jesus and we're the ones who abandon our spiritual brothers and sisters so quickly and easily. Jesus said our love for each other will be the lights of the world that wins unbelievers. All these families we just prayed for, what's the best way to, to win them? Love each other. Believers. We are one. With all our warts, with all our flaws, with all our sins, we're still one. We're God's temple. We're Christ's body. And we are God's family. We are family. We are family. And right now, I know exactly what the critical thing running through every mind in this room is. And so I just want to address it up front, okay? You hear me say, we're family. And what goes through your mind over and over again in agonizing pain is this stupid song. We are family. Guys, <laughs> let's just confess that to God right now. That song is, is hitting our mind and we confess it. And man, I had to live with this text. It was a blessing. But one of the temptations all week long is that dumb song stuck in my head uh, over and over again. So let's just confess it to God. And ask him to help us uh, be blessed. That's like the 70s, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. What is the next line? Like, all of my sisters in me. <laughs> you, know, you, got, you, got, you got YouTube it. Actually, don't. Because uh, it really gets stuck in your head. And it'll be Christmas by the time it gets out of there. So anyways, uh, on a more serious note, before we dive into the text, I want to tell you uh, as a congregation that I'm very proud of you. Because I've seen many of you stick through really difficult situations that you found yourself in when experiencing conflict in the church. Some things have been hard, they've been difficult, they've been heartbreaking, and you've persevered. You've worked through things, you've confessed sins, you've repented from sins, you've forgiven each other from sins, and you have borne long. And I think of all the wonderful fruit that I've seen in your lives, this is what I am most proud of you for. Because I know how hard it is. And to me, nothing shows the sufficiency of a crucified Savior who died for rebels more than God's own people putting to death bitterness, pride, unforgiveness, and strife through living out the cross-centered life. And I praise God and I commend you for how wonderfully you've shown this to me, even if the process was messy and at times beset by sin. So thank you for showing me Jesus in that way. So there's uh, the introduction. It only took 20 minutes. God is working. Um, and our text tonight is 1 Timothy 5, uh, verse 1 and 2. And again, I'm sorry, I'm almost done with the introduction. Uh, leading up to this passage, 
I think it is extremely important to remember that Paul has commanded Timothy to devote and discipline his life for godliness. He is to be committed to holding to sound doctrine. He is to be committed to using his gift to teach God's word. And he is to be committed to exhorting his hearers to follow uh, his commandments. I believe it's verse 11 where Paul says, command and teach these things. And remember, in the verses 6 through the end of the chapter, we also know that as Timothy does this, there will inevitably be resistance to his ministry. And what specifically was the resistance Timothy was encountering that we saw in chapter 4? Timothy was experiencing a resistance to his ministry on the grounds that he was young. And Paul commanded Timothy not to allow anyone to despise his youth or to point to Timothy's age as just grounds for not heeding his biblical exhortations. So Paul just finished commanding Timothy in these things, and we have to keep that in mind as we read our text. And so let's, finally, let's read it. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Younger men as brothers... Older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. In the life of the church, there are various types of people who, as our family members, are in different stages of life. Some are older men, and they're to be regarded as fathers. Some are older women, and they're to be regarded as mothers. The younger men are to be regarded as brothers, and the younger women as sisters with all purity. And I'm going to argue from the text that we're to regard each other as beloved family members, especially during conflict when we have to have discussions with each other about various problems. Setting before our hearts and minds that we are dealing with spiritual family members in our conflicts that should season and guide our conflict resolution in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. So let's break down the text. And right before we dive into verse 1, here's one last final introductory thought. I personally believe, having looked at the original language, that the ESV is extremely misleading in verse 1. And here's what it says. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father. Okay, what does that mean? Does it mean this? Don't ever rebuke an older man. Just encourage them. Someone might say that based on the wording of the ESV. And I think it's irresponsible wording, and I'm going to argue for why. Now, not only is this command not to rebuke, but encourage, uh, here, here's the other piece. It says, don't rebuke uh, an older man, but encourage him as you were to father. And so that, 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 that statement right there, it doesn't just apply to older men. But it also applies to all people, as the text goes on to tell Timothy that he's to do this also to uh, uh, the the other types of the people mentioned in the text. Older women as, as mothers, younger women as sisters, younger men as brothers. Don't rebuke them, but encourage them. So the problem with taking the position that there is not to be rebuke in the church, but only encouragement, is that it completely contradicts the entire letter of 1 Timothy. It also contradicts how Paul himself constantly carries himself, and it's just just not biblical. So let's, let's dive into this. I mentioned a few minutes ago to keep in mind that Paul had just finished telling Timothy not to let anybody despise his youth. Well, when when would someone be tempted to do that? When would someone despise his youth? Very likely, it's going to be when Timothy is rebuking their sin or false doctrine with his biblical exhortation. Paul just told Timothy at the end of chapter 4 to immerse himself in a faithful ministry of the word that will so exhort others to repent and grow in Christ that some are going to be offended and wrongly resist him because of his age. So having just got done saying all this to Timothy in chapter 4, Uh, Is Paul now in in chapter 5 verse 1 telling him that whenever someone resists your your, your teaching because of your age, don't rebuke anyone, just encourage them? In chapter 4 verses 1 through 5, Paul just went crazy rebuking the false gospels. I mean, he couldn't have been any bolder than he was. And then in verse 6, he told Timothy to do the same thing. Okay, well, what if the people advancing false gospels are older? Is it supposed to encourage them? 
And like, hey, hey, man, that's a great thought that, you know, we have to earn our salvation. I appreciate you sharing that, brother. Um, you can't rebuke that? In 1 Timothy 1, verse 18 through 20, Paul had personally rebuked Hymenaeus and Alexander so strongly that they've been disciplined out of the church for their blasphemies. In chapter 6, verse 17 through 19, Paul tells Timothy to charge the rich to be rich in good deeds, to be generous, and to be ready to share. Well, what if they refuse? Paul said, charge them to do that. And what if they said, no, I'm not doing that. I don't care if my brothers and sisters in need. I worked my whole life on buying a boat. What's he supposed to do if they're older than him? Say, oh, okay, yeah, man, that's great. That's what God wants. Build your barns. Is not Timothy to rebuke them? In writing to another young pastor, Paul told Titus in Titus 2.15, he said, declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. That's what he said to Titus. So is Paul teaching two fundamentally different approaches to ministry when addressing Timothy and Titus? So the answer to all of these questions is obviously a resounding no. And I think if we look more closely at the wording and at better English translations of this verse, we'll gain some clarity. So Paul says, uh, the ESV puts it right here, do not rebuke an older man. So let's, let's break that first part down. And as you look at the word for rebuke in verse 1, it is a translation of the Greek word epiplepso. And this Greek word only appears in this verse in the New Testament. And this word does not merely mean rebuke, but rather it carries with it the idea of strong rebuke, even a verbally violent rebuke. One Greek dictionary I looked at defined it as to strike at someone with your words. We might call it going off on someone or raging on someone or snapping on someone. And so that is the fuller meaning of the word. And that is why the NIV and the NASB, in my opinion, they rightly translate this verse and they do a much better job of capturing the accurate meaning. Here's what the NASB says. It says, do not sharply rebuke an older man. The NIV says, do not rebuke an older man harshly. So it is not rebuke as such that is forbidden, but it is a kind of rebuke. A rebuke that is violent, that is not self-controlled, that is unloving, that is sinful, that is hateful, that is filled with animosity and bitterness. Now the other parts of verse 1 that not only uh, is a sharp rebuke forbidden, but as ESV puts it, uh, encouragement is to be given. Yeah, that, that's the second part we need to consider. Don't rebuke an older man, but it, encourage him. And again, I think translating this Greek word for encouragement as encouragement, I think that is an awful and irresponsible way to translate the word here. And the word is called parakal, parakale. I, I can't pronounce it very, right, very well. Parakale. And I, here's the reason why I think it's an irresponsible translation, to translate it as encouragement. I think it's irresponsible not because encouragement isn't a real part or valid uh, part of the range of meaning of this word, but because it can be uh, very much, it can, the, the translating it as encouragement can very much unintentionally communicate that we're to not ever encourage, or, or we're not to ever rebuke each other, but we only encourage each other. Now, as I already mentioned, that interpretation it contradicts the entire letter of 1 Timothy as well as the immediate context and flow of thought. Now, this word here for, that's translated as encouragement, it can also mean, listen to these definitions, to exhort, to urge, or to appeal to. And when trying to determine what range of meaning best fits a word uh, when you're translating something, context has to always determine the meaning you select. So based on the flow of thought from chapter 4, where you're not to dis command and teach these things, don't let anyone despise you for your youth, you tell me, does encouragement fit better? Or appeal to an older man? Urge an older man? Does, does, that, does that fit better? And the NASB, I think, gets it absolutely right, where it says, uh, do not sharply uh, rebuke an older man, but appeal to him as a father. 
I think that is much, much, much better translation than the ESV. I like the ESV a lot, but it's really bad on this verse. So I know that's a bit technical, but it's important. So the idea here is that when Timothy is discharging his ministry, when his youth is despised, or when for any other reason people in the congregation will not walk in sound doctrine or consistent godliness, the way in which he is to rebuke them is not to be harsh and violent about it, but rather to lovingly appeal to them as family members. I can just hear Proverbs 12.18 ringing through 1 Timothy 5.1. Here's Proverbs 12.18. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts. That would be the harsh, over-the-top rebuke. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. Appealing to one as a father or mother or sister or brother. When rebuking, you can cut with your words like a soldier with a sword whose intentions are to kill, or you can cut like a surgeon whose intentions are to heal. Cutting's not wrong. Both people cut, but one cuts out of evil violence and out of a desire to punish and harm and out of a desire to tear down and destroy, while the other cuts to rid a loved family member of something harmful, that they might be healed, that they might grow, that they might be stronger, and that they might be more like Jesus. And Paul's command to Timothy is that he's to seek to bring healing through his tongue when he corrects, and that he's not to destroy people. That's the meaning of 1 Timothy 5.1. Do not rebuke an older man or anyone harshly, but appeal to them as a father, mother, sister, or brother, depending on who you're dealing with. Now, for clarity, I want to acknowledge that there are many times where there are minor sins and flaws and weaknesses in believers, and we, we, we don't have to address everything. Paul's not telling Timothy, go make sure you're dealing with every little thing. So, can you imagine how miserable that would be? Timothy's not to wrist slap over every little flaw. However, if Timothy is unwilling to correct when he sees significant issues, then listen, he's a false prophet who does nothing but tickle the itching ears of worldly people who cherish sin. And we know from Jeremiah and Ezekiel that it's a sign of a false prophet to only declare peace and safety to sinners if there is no true peace. Godly correction must be part of every faithful ministry. And to help Timothy do this, Paul wisely goes through every possible season of life someone in the congregation can be in, and he tells Timothy to address them as family members. Addressing them as family should season his heart. It should fill him with love and longing for them, and it should cause him to correct them with the right spirit. Now, occasionally, as we see in Titus 1.13, when, when he's rebuking the lazy men in Crete, sometimes people are rebuked sharply. Paul says, to re it's a commandment from Paul, Titus 1.13, rebuke them sharply. However, even when that's done, it's to be done with tact and self-control. But most of the time, our default setting is to operate with clear, direct, yet loving and kind correction to our beloved family in Christ. And so what we will now do is spend the uh, rest of the message meditating on how to do this to various members of our spiritual family, which is the church. So we'll start with uh, older men. That's the first group of people Paul instructs Timothy uh, uh, in how to deal with them, is older men. They are to be addressed as father. Now the word for older men is presbyteros, which is the word used for elder in other contexts. So it's possible one could conclude Paul is telling Timothy how to address pastors. Now, I personally think because the context is all family members, that's not what he has in mind. I think he's talking about literally older men. Uh, however, addressing older men would also apply to leadership in the church, pastors and deacons. And so with older men and leadership in the church, addressing them... They are not to be violently attacked with reckless correction. Instead, they are to be lovingly appealed to as father figures. Now, a father is to be someone who loves his family. 
A father serves his family, works hard for his family, he provides for his family, leads his family, and he sets the direction and tone for the family. He engages them, he loves them, he gives them time and attention, he offers encouragement and support, he offers correction and discipline, he offers guidance, he leads the family in the word of God, he prays for them regularly, and he uses his authority and God-given strength to become a servant to his family according to what the Bible says they need, which may not always be what they want. Now, a father's chief longing and desire for his family is to see them grow and thrive in the faith and to love Jesus Christ supremely. And so he gives himself to facilitate that in whatever way he can. Now, no father of any family is perfect. But Paul recognizes this, and God recognizes this, which is why Paul tells Timothy how to address older men in their sins and imperfections. Now, despite the imperfections and sins of good fathers or of real godly Christian leaders, they are to be respected, loved, honored, and held in high esteem even when they're being corrected. If you correct an older man and your heart is thankful to God for their fatherly role that this person fills, if your heart is grateful for how this man has served the body, and if your heart loves such a one and honors them as the authority God's made them to be, you're going to have a very different spirit, demeanor, and attitude about you than if you approach them acting like a disrespectful, bratty child. And Paul's exhortation is not to deal with older men in the church as though they are infallible popes who can't ever be questioned or addressed. Rather, when you question or address them, when it happens, is to be done with the honor and respect due to a loving father. So it might go something like this. Person X. I'm very grateful for your role in my life and the lives of others as a spiritual father figure. You've been a great blessing to many. And I thank God for leaders like you. In my desire to see your leadership continue to thrive, I want to address this specific issue with you. I feel like if this was, was dealt with, it would strengthen and enhance what is already a great blessing to many. I love you and I, I want to not only continue to see you lead well, but also to lead even better. As I know that would be an even greater blessing to others who've already been so richly encouraged. Now that or something like that is completely different than indulging a vindictive tongue lashing towards those who are older men in the church. And a good father, he's going to listen, process what you said, and then respond in holiness and love, and hopefully the, the result will be a much greater familial intimacy in the household of God. So there's an example of how you could address Older men as fathers and appeal to them. Now, the next group Paul guides Timothy in how to address in our text is younger men. And he tells them to regard what? Younger men as brothers. Now, younger men in the Lord, they are a great blessing because they often have tremendous zeal and energy for God. And the, but the challenge with that is that this zeal can be short sighted. It can lack a much-needed further understanding. It can be blinded to other important issues that also need to be considered. And there can also be a lack of maturity that is a hindrance. And so correction becomes a significant part of being in a loving relationship with a godly younger man who were to regard as brothers. Now, in this relationship, Timothy is in the role of an older brother. And what's a brother? Not a worldly brother. What's a real Christian godly brother? A believer in Christ is a guy. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, good. That's a, that's a good starting point. A believer in Christ is a guy. Amen. A good brother is someone who genuinely cares sincerely about the spiritual condition of his brother. He might see his brother struggling, and rather than beat him down and humiliate him and destroy him or harm him, he steps up and he strengthens his brother. 
When others are destroying his brother, he has his brother's back from a spiritual standpoint. When his brother is going astray, he doesn't passively stand by and watch his brother get destroyed by sin and Satan. Instead, he steps in and corrects his brother as one who is a strong part of his life. He corrects him and enters his life as one who is from the same father, as one who is part of the same spiritual family, as one who is committed to his brother's spiritual well-being, as one who is a committed part of his life, and as one who will walk through the most difficult times with him, and as one who's not, gonna, who's not going to aid him in destroying his life in sin, but who will lovingly stand and appeal to him to walk in holiness to represent the family well, and to live a life worthy of our Heavenly Father. And so he will appeal to him and try to be an influence in his brother's life to cause his brother to walk in the Spirit. And the correcting brother, he knows the erring brother, and as he shares, he's woven into the erring brother's life, he enjoys his brother, he's bonded to his brother, and he looks forward to many years of sharing Christ in a real way with his brother. So if his heart towards his brother is like that, what kind of spirit do you think he's going to correct it? He might say something like, Brother, I, I love you so much, man, and I'm just grateful that I've been able to grow up in the Lord with you. It's a precious thing to have someone to share the same season of life with. I'm, I, I, I've so often been encouraged by your faith in Christ and your striving for him in my life. You have stirred me to love and good deeds many, many times. But here's the deal. I need to address this issue with you because I believe it's harming you. And as your brother, I'm going to stand up for you and take on this spiritual enemy that's trying to ruin you. And I'm going to do it by addressing this issue in your life. And listen, I, I love you and my heart is to commit myself to your continued progress in Christ's likeness. So the issue here is whatever. And I just want to plead with you to turn from this as I believe it's harming you in whatever particular way. And I love you and I long for your growth. I'm on your team. So let's press into the Lord together. Now a humble and teachable brother is going to receive that. He's going to be thankful for it. And even if it stings in the moment, he'll thank God that he is a real brother who actually loves him rather than a man-pleasing hypocrite who will not seek his true good. Hopefully, uh, the brother will deal with his issues, and the brothers will be closer as a result. That may take time. Sometimes the erring brother may not initially receive the correction. He may walk through a dark season for a while, but it's the hope of the correcting brother that God will move. And in due time, the erring brother will repent, and oneness will be restored. If you're seeing someone as your real brother like that, that's going to guide so much. You know, all the anxieties are talking, oh, I'm just afraid I'm going to, you know, not say the right thing, or I'll be too much of a wimp, or I'll be too rude, or whatever. If you will season your heart to see them in that way, it will guide so much uh, in doing this. The first thing I pray in conflict resolution is give me a pure heart and fill me with love for this person. Because I know, and if that doesn't happen, everything I see is going to be polluted. <coughs> Now, the next group Timothy will have to address as a minister uh, is older women. And Paul gives instruction there. It says, Paul tells him to address older women as mothers. Now, a godly mother is someone who has a wonderful influence in the home. Her presence is the aroma of Christ to her family. There's a kindness to her, a sweetness to her, a way about her that makes the home personalized, that makes it loving and warm and hospitable and nurturing, and it causes the family members to enjoy Jesus in a very enriched way. She nurtures her children, she instructs them, she's an example of divine strength as she looks upon the difficult days ahead with confidence in God, and she stands in His grace and she's a vessel that dispenses hope in God to those around her in her house. 
In wonderful humility, she engages and fulfills so many tasks that seem menial to others. So many things that go unseen, but are nevertheless precious in the sight of God. And she does it without any praise or recognition most of the time. Her family is the object of her prayers, and the family is confident that she's there for them, that she's committed to them, and her presence in the home has a calming, stabilizing, soothing effect on her home that helps her family grow in their confidence in Christ. And her children are supremely confident that she cares for them in a Christ-centered way, and oh, how worthy of respect and honor such a woman is. Now, as with all good fathers or spiritual leaders, no mother is perfect. She's a wonderful blessing, but she's not Jesus. And she is one who is saved by the same gospel as everyone else, and she has her own sin and weakness to deal with. Nevertheless, she is to be revered. Now, in correcting such a woman, what kind of respect, attitude, and spirit should she be addressed in? If this is how you view a mom, for all that blessedness I just described, and then you go to an older woman to offer correction, that's going to govern your heart and your spirit. You might say something like, hey, uh, so-and-so, older woman X, I just want you to know that, listen, the feminine strength you exude in Christ the peace in which you carry yourself, the stability of your walk, the love of others that you're so devoted to showing, the detail in which you care for other people in small ways, that is so appreciated by me and other people as well. You've just been a very important part of our lives, and we thank God for you. And because you're so dear to us, there's something I want to address with you. And then you clearly, kindly, and fairly state the issue. And say, I just want to appeal with you, appeal with you, appeal to you, with all of my heart, as one who is so appreciative of your presence in our life, that you consider this and excel still more in this area in your walk. How effective do you think an appeal like that's going to be? Likely, it will be very effective. Now, there's no guarantee. I mean, people rejected Jesus, and Jesus always appealed to things the perfect way. So none of this is a guarantee for relational success, but it's just that you want on your end to be blameless. And so when you correct someone with that type of spirit, who can bring a charge against you? Regard older women as mothers as you correct them, and you'll find a much greater maturity and love accompanies your correction in dealing with older women. Now the last group Timothy is to address is younger women. And Paul says to address younger women as sisters with all purity. Now again, Timothy is to assume the role of an older brother towards a younger sister here. And as he addresses her, he's to do so with all purity. And it's important to note that younger women have this added exhortation to be addressed with all purity. Why do you think that is? I think it's present because Paul knows, and certainly the Holy Spirit who inspired Paul knows, that when younger women are being ministered to by men in the church, certain bonds can be created that if not dealt with in ways that have proper boundaries around them, they can lead both into temptation and sexual sin. Many pastors have fallen into sexual immorality that began with counseling younger women. And what starts off as a good thing can quickly be twisted by Satan and plunged into ruin. So efforts must be taken that Timothy minister to and correct younger women in all purity. And maybe it's meeting in public, or maybe it's having your wife go along with you, or meeting in group settings. Whatever it is, efforts are to be made to ensure that these interactions happen in all purity. We are to love the women in our church and have appropriate and godly interactions with them. But we must remember, as we're interacting with with women in our church, especially the younger ones, we are their holy family as we do this. What does a good brother do towards his sister? He guards her purity. If someone is coming towards his sisters with ill intentions, it's usually, who's usually the first one to pick up on it? The brother. 
The brother is usually the one who can spot this out faster than anybody because he he has a sense of responsibility that he's going to protect his sister and fight for her honor and fight for her purity and he is ready to defend it if he must. The godly brother in interacting with younger women with his sister in Christ, he helps his sister grow in Christ. He guides her and he builds their relationship on the holy worship of God and he will fight off that which would defile her purity. Whether we're talking doctrinal purity, sexual purity, or any other kind of purity, because he has a brotherly love for her in all godliness, he will contend for her soul. He's not one who comes masked as a brother and then tries to reel her into situations in which he seeks to steal her purity. That's a demonic brother, not a Christian one. He cares primarily for her soul, but also for her physical well-being. And as a brother, uh, he, he, will, he will fight the forces of hell with all of his might to defend his sister's godliness in Christ. And he is to appreciate and cherish his dear sister, who no doubt, countless times, has supported him as he follows Christ. Many times, his dear sister maybe has prayed for him, or given him good counsel, or helped him, or fed him, or met his needs, or encouraged him to love Jesus more and more as he's been inspired by the godly devotion of his sweet Christian sister, whom he loves deeply with all purity. I think there's a unique power that God's given women as he's designed his helpmates that sometimes when men are just destroyed and totally discouraged, whether it be your wife or your mom or your sister, in the Lord or otherwise, when they encourage you, I think God has a unique anointing on their life. And there's just a special way that it lifts you with that. And I know, I know you guys have as well. I have many times had... Uh, great times where my sisters in the Lord have refreshed my spirit. But uh, sometimes I got a couple of times I get an email from Kathleen or something from Judy or Jenny says something or Tatiana or Crystal, whoever. And it's like, ah, oh, man, it's just a shot in the arm and it just lifts you. There, it, it's a wonderful thing to have godly Christian sisters that help you in the Lord. All of us need this. But as we interact with them, as sisters interact with brothers and vice versa, is to be done in all purity. And so for a brother who is going to address an issue in a, in a younger woman's life, uh, yeah, if he's a good brother, he's going to be aware of the times that his sweet sister needs correction. And it can come in many forms when a younger woman needs correction in the Lord and most of the time, I think it's the older women who should be giving the correction, but Paul doesn't tell Timothy, never talk to a woman. He tells her how to do it, so there's a, there, there's a balance to this. Uh, it can come in many forms, but oftentimes when a younger woman, uh, it, it, the one I want to highlight the most, because this is where, especially when I was in college ministry, I saw this all the time, where younger women needed a lot of correction. It's when the sister is considering dating or marrying someone who is not godly. I saw this so much when I was in college. A younger woman desired to be married so bad that she would talk herself into believing the most ungodly man was a Christian. And so a loving older brother, he must fight for his sister's purity in these moments. He's got to appeal to her in love, not harsh sword thrusts. He might say to her, well, well, well a woman is, is considering marrying an ungodly man. Dear sister, I'm so thankful for our relationship in Christ. It's such a constant encouragement to me uh, and, and that I've been supported by you, strengthened by you, convicted by you, and blessed by you in countless ways as we've enjoyed Jesus together. Listen, I, I am so excited for what God's doing in your life, and I can't wait to see what He has in store for you as you commit to walking in Him more and more. But listen, I have to tell you this as your brother. I am charged with protecting your soul, and right now I see the guy that you're interested in, though he claims to love Jesus, his life contradicts his profession of faith. He has no desire to be with God's people, he's never in the Word of God, and all he talks about is the world. And when you talk about him, I've never one time heard you say that his influence causes you to cherish Jesus more and more. 
So listen, as your brother who loves you so much, I want to appeal to you to please back off of this relationship because I don't think it's healthy for your soul. And listen, I know it's hard to wait, but I'm praying God will bring you somebody. But trust me when I say it's your brother who loves you that you want it to be the right guy who loves Jesus more than anything. And I promise when that guy shows up, I'm going to rejoice to see you be with him. But I just don't see this right now with the guy you're with. Please, don't go there. I care for you too much. If you cherish what a sister is, that's going to guide you in how you appeal to younger women. Or maybe the issue is something else. But when I was in college, I just saw that over and over again. So listen, that kind of encouragement, the kind that takes who you're talking to and considers them a beloved family member, that kind of encouragement has a much greater chance of being received by a godly sister than a brother saying, hey, sis, the guy you're dating's a loser and I can't stand him and you're stupid for being with him. That's probably not going to go over too well. The younger ladies in, in the church, they are our dear sisters in Christ. We have to care for them. We have to honor them. We have to protect their pure devotion to Christ. And we have to be there for them. We have to help provide for them. We have to fight off the wolves that try to ravage them. And we have to labor to present them holy in Christ. And we dare not ourselves be vile wolves who are willing partners in their destruction. These are our sisters. We must love them as God would have us love them. So, beloved of God, you are his children, and we are his family, together as one. And God cares so deeply for his family that he sent his favorite family member, namely his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us so that he could adopt us into his family, even though all we ever did was treat his family horrible, horribly by killing his son on a cross. And when he saw our sin, he didn't run away from us. He didn't say there's no hope for us. He didn't hate us and destroy us. Instead, he came and he lived among us and he died for us to make us his own. It was costly. He had to correct us. He had to rebuke us. He had to teach us and provide for us and die for us to make us part of his family. In fact, he had to experience his own family split to bring us into the family when the father and son were separated on the cross as he poured out his wrath on Jesus. His family was momentarily broken to bring you in. Now, if our triune God did that for you and for me to make us part of his family... Should we not also bear with and love our spiritual family members in like manner? Now, I know love is hard, but it's so worth it. Now, I want to plead with you with all my heart, don't let some bad experiences justify a life of self-pity, a life of cynicism, and a life of keeping God's people at a distance. It will only destroy you. I've seen people do that, and without exception, there is not one of them that I want to imitate anything in their faith when I see them. We're family in Christ. And in this life, we're always going to be imperfect. That's true. We're always going to be sinful. There are always going to be issues to deal with. But here's the other reality. For those who are truly born again and part of God's family, we are also always real and spirit-filled and fruitful in the Lord. That is a reality that's just as true as our remaining sin. So let us love Let us press on to love our dear family in Christ. We are God's treasured ones. His people are not your enemy. Satan, sin, and the world are the enemy. And so let us fight the real enemy, not our eternal family. I love that line on the war room. You got to keep the real enemy at your home when she's talking to the, they're struggling in their marriage and she's talking about uh, the one who wants to remain hidden. Uh, The one that comes to steal and kill and destroy. Fight the real enemy. We're not enemies. We're family. And the gospel must mark how we interact with each other. And if we blow it and we address someone, not as a father, but as Genghis Khan, like, okay, repent for it. And move on. If we uh, address, uh, you know, whatever, I mean, we could go on and keep it. it, it, it we, just, just, just repent. Like, this is, it, it's okay. Just repent. And we can keep moving on. 
But there is an enemy of the family of God, and he wants to rip the family apart. Just as he rips all families apart, our nation testifies to it, every nation does. So as he rips earthly families apart, he also tries to rip spiritual families apart. And we can't let him. In the grace of God, and the power of God, and the word of God, by the spirit of God, and prayer to God, through the gospel of God, we will watch Jesus step on his filthy head and crush it in our midst. Romans 16, the God of peace will soon crush his head. But just as Jesus, how did he win us in his family? How does he win blessing? By suffering, by cross. Real fruit is hard fought. And it's won and produced through suffering and hardship and crucifixion and death. Where God brings life and fruit. I don't know why he did it that way. Uh, but he did. So we have, to, we have to understand that and live into that. And if we do, we'll be able to persevere in godliness, bearing with one another, repenting of our sins, forgiving, bearing with each other. Uh, if one has a complaint against another, forgiving as God in Christ has forgave you, so you must also forgive one another. Colossians 3. We are family. Go hear the song uh, uh, if you haven't heard it. Uh, I believe that's the idea that Paul's trying to communicate in this text uh, to Timothy of how to appeal to people in the church when you have to bring correction. Not with a blowtorch, but with a tongue that brings healing. So is there any, are there any questions or comments? Now, I know there's some things I, I didn't cover. Feel free to bring that up if you like. Kathleen? Just to tack on to that, I just love that passage in Ephesians where it talks about considering others as more important than yourselves. Yeah. It's just such a view into humility that helps the right thought process of dealing with any kind of difficulties. That if you level set yourself and you know, yeah. you know, you're all upset, you know, wait, yeah. he or she is more important than me. So yeah. how do I come under that? Yeah. And he had no reason to. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, amen. Amen. Getting your heart pure is the first thing. That's the first to be first step in going to approach somebody. If that happens, you'll be all right. And if you don't, even if you are a hundred percent right, you will slaughter people with the truth. Uh, Kathleen, did you have your hand up? Yeah. I I don't enjoy confronting people. Maybe it's because I don't enjoy being confronted. That's probably the reason. But yeah. I had an experience real recently yeah. with a woman who's my peer and much more godly than me. But I saw something in her yeah. that I wanted to talk to her about, and I prayed about it a lot. And she came to me yeah. before I could say the word. Yeah. And Praise that, God. It's a sweet thing. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. I think it's good that you don't like it, confronting people. There's probably something wrong if you do. <laughs> I don't think anybody likes it. Um, I hate it, and I pray I always will. Um, I think that's probably a good thing. But yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, Praying about things, that kind of goes back to that caveat I made in the sermon of, this sounds like something that needed to be addressed, but there is a time to kind of wait for a minute and just pray. And sometimes th- that is exactly, uh, God works those things out. Amen. It's a good reminder. Anyone else? I think remembering that I have to be done in love and remembering what love is. Yeah. And that it's not us that can do it alone. We just can't. We're not loving. We're not patient. We're not kind. We say ourselves we're prideful. We're boastful. We talk about everything that happens in the week, no matter what it is, by our nature. And if we work by our nature and not by the Lord, the love of God in a conversation of any kind, then it won't bring them closer or you closer in that fact. Anywhere near Christ. Yeah, that's uh Unfortunately, pretty easy to to do that. So, yeah. Anyone else? All right. Well, let's pray, uh, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you for the privilege of being able to be part of your family. Uh, we don't deserve that. We deserve to be uh, fatherless, siblingless. 
Uh, we deserve to be just isolated in suffering because of our sins. But in your kindness, in, in love, you predestined us for the adoption of sons. And we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for uh, coming and seeking us out and saving us and doing everything necessary, like a good father does, doing everything necessary to bring us into your family and care for us and adopt us. And it's a wonderful privilege to have you as our father, but also to have each other as real, spiritual, eternal family members. And Father, I just pray you'll help us uh, honor that and esteem that and um, feel the sense of privilege that is, God, and, and, and uh, enjoy that and uh, persevere in that and grow in it, Lord. And I just pray there's no question, Lord, uh, something will come up again in the life of our congregation. And I pray, God, when it does, all of our hearts and minds will be reminded of your word. And we will address each other as beloved family members and that you will work uh, in us great harmony and peace and unity and love. And even these families we pray for before the service might see that and be saved. And Lord, we just thank you. Uh, you're so kind to us and we love you and we praise you with all our heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.